HB, thank you for that message this morning. And uh, Dr. MacArthur, thank you for the whole day yesterday. We were all just filled to overflowing with uh, all that you gave us there. I want to ask a couple of questions that get to the heart of why you are who you are. And I'm going to start with you, Dr. MacArthur, and just say that you have been at Grace Community Church for 45 years, which means that the average pastorate is somewhere around five years. You've had nine of them in one place. You could have had nine of them in different places. Your life could have taken you from place to place, coast to coast. You could have been in different churches in different places. Why one church for 45 years? Why does that make your preaching ministry different than it otherwise would have been? Uh, well, first, I never had any other offers. Uh, um, it makes it different because you accumulate a body of work out of necessity. Um, because you're preaching to the same congregation week in and week out for 45 years, you can't repeat yourself. So you, you wake up one day and you realize you've just gone through the entire New Testament verse by verse and it's taken you 42 years. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident uh, knowing just human nature and, and knowing the, the, the compulsion that you, you, you want to cover certain subjects that if I'd have moved around, I'd have gone back over the same things again and again and again and again because I would have felt that various congregations needed to hear that. When I started, uh, there was no such thing as a cassette tape. So you could repeat yourself. <clears throat> now, uh, it, it's a different world. So I, I think it's, um, I guess it was the Lord's purpose for me. And um, I was mentioning to you that uh, this last Tuesday, I wrote the last chapter of the last book in the whole commentary series. Well, this is the first week of my life I haven't had commentary chapters to write. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I think, I, you know, God had a purpose. God had a plan. He knew he was, where he was taking me. I never intended to be one place my whole life, I, but I never questioned that. Uh, I did, not only did I pastor nine churches in terms of five-year blocks, I pastored maybe seven or eight churches just by staying in one place and having the congregation change. So I woke up this morning with this on my mind. So I did a thought experiment. I wrote down the name of every major preacher that I thought was just intergenerationally, for some period of time, respected, known as a preacher. And beside their name, I wrote down every church I knew they'd been associated with. And almost in every case, it was one man in one church. I think those great preachers, you think of Martin Lloyd-Jones, Charles Spurgeon, you just go back and you realize you're talking about one man, one church, one lifetime. And that's an enormous statement, I think. It's something that a lot of younger preachers sometimes don't think about. I'm not even sure you thought about it on the front end by what you just said. No, I didn't think about it, but, uh, you know, I... I lived past the time when you're supposed to leave. You know, I just, I just kept going. <clears throat> Maybe there's a certain amount of ignorance about that, but uh, yeah, I, I can just say, and, and coming at that same issue another way, I'm living really in a kind of a ministerial millennium. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's just short of euphoria in the ministry of Grace Church now because, as you know, when, when you get past all the criticism and you get past all the, the uh, immaturity and you get past all the levels of conflict and, and you keep pouring out the Word and pouring out the Word, it creates its own environment. It creates its own culture. And that culture is so deep and so far-reaching and so wide. Uh, you know, I, I remember reading um, um, a biography of, of uh, Pink, Arthur Pink, uh, and he died this broken, angry, hostile man living in a flat somewhere up in a coastal city in Scotland, mad at the whole world. And, uh, and, I, and I even, you know, I know a little about Tozer's end, you know, where he was bitter and angry and 
all of that. And, and I think, um, I mean, there, that can happen with a lot of people, but it doesn't happen with people who stay in one place a long time because you outlive your critics in one sense and you, you see the long-term work of the word. So my, you know, how do I translate that into encouragement to you? Be very patient. Be very patient. See if God will let you get through those early battles and survive all of that, and uh, your end will be far more wonderful than your beginning. So I want to trace that out just a little bit further because when I made that list this morning, thinking of this conversation, and I realized that in almost every one of these cases where you had, I guess what we could call for one of a better way of putting it, peak preaching, you know, when the, this person came to prominence uh, like a Lloyd-Jones or, or even a Spurgeon, you're talking about one church for a very long period of time. And then it struck me, you know, we really need to talk about one other aspect, and that is that preaching is not a man standing at a pulpit with no one in front of him. There's a partnership with the congregation. And so to what extent would you say that your preaching ministry at Grace Community Church has been shaped by the fact that there has been a congregation trained and ready and eager to hear the kind of preaching you're bringing? I'm not, I'm not sure I know exactly what you're driving at, but uh, there are only so many things you can preach on in the Bible. And if you keep talking to the same people for half a century, you've got to think of different ways to say it. Um, they have to feel like they just heard something new when, in fact, they heard something very old that you've told them 500 times. Uh, so the, the, the challenge is just an ever, the challenge is an ever enriching, enriching, enriching approach to Scripture. Um, re repetition, well, familiarity breeds contempt. Re repetition of saying the same thing in the same way to the same people tunes them out. So how do you keep these people, some of whom are still there from the beginning, not, not many, but, but many, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, so forth. Um, there, there, is a, there is a demanding uh, reality of freshness. So people say, do you, do, you, do you have to study like you always did? Yeah, not to understand anymore, but to say things in a way that is fresh, and, and that's what the Word of God allows me to do. And if I wasn't an expositor, I would have run out of topics, and I would have run out of saying things the same way long, long ago. And you never would have addressed a lot of things you had to address. Well, and that's the, the other thing, did. yeah. You, I mean, you cover absolutely everything. I, I often say that you, we have the mind of Christ that's in the Scripture, and certainly the pastor ought to be the one who can always speak the mind of Christ on every issue. I mean, that's what we offer to not only the church but the world. When asking the question, I can just simply say as background, when I travel from church to church preaching, I can tell the minute I get up to preach what they think preaching is. Sure, sure. And I can tell whether they are listening regularly to preaching and have been trained to do so, and whether they're eager and hungry to hear exposition or whether they plan to be entertained or whatever. Sure. When I preach for H.B. Charles, I can tell your congregation is pretty hungry for preaching. And, uh, and your congregation makes it a little easier to understand that because they will say that right out loud, you know. Uh, white churches just plan for you to understand with their eyes. Uh, get a little more feedback at your church. What a great, great experience to preach at your church there down in Jacksonville. How did you train them to listen to preaching that way? I've only been at the church I served for six years. Um, I uh, arrived, though, however, at a hurting church that was living in the aftermath of a moral fall. But I, I and for that reason, among others, I didn't want anything to do with this church. Um, when I arrived and someone would ask me, what is the joy of pastoring this church? It was that by God's gracious favor, I arrived at a church where preaching is in season. And they wanted to hear me preach. They wanted to hear the word. And uh, so it's uh, both an encouragement and a challenge. Um, I would say in the church that um, I grew up in, in the church I served in Los Angeles, my father 
was more of an orator, a D.E. King, Manuel Scott, Gardner Taylor type of preacher. And uh, I was learning exposition. And I just think what uh, Dr. MacArthur said is wise, just to be patient. They, they put up with me for 18 years and helped make a preacher out of me, encouraging me week after week to keep at, they wanted to hear explanation of the word. And I would just say, if you're at a place where that's not the norm, uh, I think Bible exposition is an acquired taste. Like you said last night, people don't have patience for it because they never heard it. But once they get it and get a taste for it, they don't want anything else. So I'd had a question for a long time, having so much love for the tradition of preaching in the African-American church. I did have a question. That question was answered for me fairly recently. The question was, I know how an African-American congregation lets you know they agree with you. But how do they let you know they disagree with you? <laughs> and uh, I found that out because I, I was in a conference not too long ago where a preacher was preaching and uh, he was m missing the point. He was maligning the text. He, I don't even know that he knew he was. He was, he was really mispreaching. And this elderly African-American preacher stood up in the back of the room and said, you got us in a mess, brother, clean it up. <laughs> I want that man sitting in every congregation. Yes, I, I, I want that alarm system built in. In, 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 my, in my first congregation in Los Angeles, I had a uh, old sainted deaconess who would sit on the second row. And uh, if I was preaching, if I was getting at it, uh, she would say, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. And if I was missing it, she'd say, help him, Lord. Help him, Lord. <laughs> you see, I, I have a, a friend who has twin boys. They're now about 10. And one of them's quiet, one of them isn't. And I said, how's that work? He said, well, this one's just saying what that one's thinking. <laughs> All right, I can just tell you that I think the African-American church is just saying what I think the white church is thinking. <laughs> we can learn from each other in this respect. Yes, Communicate a little better. You left a church you became pastor of at age 17. Now, I have to tell you, I enjoy talking about that because people talk about how young I was when I became president of the seminary at age 33, okay? <laughs> and you became pastor of a church at age 17. And you were there for a number of years, and then you, and that had been your father's church, and, and you left that. Talk about how the Lord brought about that calling in your life. Yeah, I often say I was the last person to know the Lord was sending me to Jacksonville. Um, I went to Jacksonville. I had been pastor in the church I served for almost 18 years. Um, not so much just me nurturing them. Over those years, they had nurtured me from 17 to 35. And I had no intention of going anywhere. Um, I just went to fill the pulpit in Jacksonville. Uh, the leaders made it clear that that's all that was happening. And I was on the same page. <laughs> uh, and um, afterward, the church had been in prayer. And they said, we're not going to pray anymore. He told us to pray until the Lord identified our next pastor. That's our next pastor. Go get that guy from L.A. And um, this whole thing kind of moved. It was almost a game of chicken. The leaders were, I kept I'm not coming to Jacksonville. And they're, we're going to move forward. This church is going to call you, and you're going to have to figure out what to do on the other side of that. Um, and um, that was just, I, I just, it was, the, my family was in the church I grew up in. My faith roots were all there. Um, I don't know if I would have been able to, the church called, I was flying there to tell them no. And uh, my wife's prayers, really encouragement. My wife told me that uh, I'm with you whatever you decide.
And I really think that was a breakthrough for me to pray, honestly, to, to get the sense of clarity. So in line with this uh, consideration of being in a place and the importance of that place to preaching, how has your preaching changed from Los Angeles to Jacksonville? Um, well, I forced myself to, to work on expositions I had not been doing, had not done in LA. A part of my sermon preparation is a part of my personal sanctification, studying the word each week. So I just could not go to Jacksonville. My wife couldn't understand. You got 18 years of preaching. Just pull a file and go to the, and, and let me tell you something. When I'm in a jam, I pull a file. <laughs> um, but for my own soul's sake, I needed to, to press forward. And I would also just say that um, what I would say as a young preacher, I mean, at 25, I think I, I tried, I was in Ephesians seven years ago when I left Los Angeles. And the way I would have preached the text I preached today, that what I did before is just maybe seven years, my faith, my maturity, my understanding of scripture. I don't sound like that guy. Uh, then I, I hope I've grown and I think that reflects I hope it's reflected in my preaching Dr. MacArthur when you went to Grace Community Church in 1969 and uh, You had recently graduated from Talbot Theological Seminary You were theologically defined you knew who you were and uh, you started to preach But someone who's followed your preaching through all those years would say well, here's where John MacArthur at least makes a very different emphasis than you would have made in 1969. How do you trace that own development in your thought and in your preaching over time? Um, <clears throat> I think the refinement, I, my theology has been the same. Uh, and, and it was a historic theology that was basically deposited in, in my mind uh, by a faithful father and, um, and influential seminary professors. Um, System, a systematic theology, a biblical theology, all, all of those things, the tools uh, to, to handle the Word of God were all given to me. My, uh, my, my theology had stood the test of time. It was a historic theology. It wasn't aberrant. It wasn't quirky. So I, I was standing on some pretty, pretty heavy shoulders. I was mentioning to one of the students that I cut my teeth in seminary on B.B. Uh, Warfield, um, the Inspiration and Authority of Scripture, which you're, you're giving away. That book was seminal in, in my life. Uh, so that was my tradition and my trajectory even then. But what has changed in my preaching is that I've, I've needed to run that theology through every passage in the New Testament. And in the process of that, I decided that I would take, look at the Old Testament the way the Apostle Paul does in 1 Corinthians 10, where he says, these things have happened as examples unto you upon whom the end of the ages have come. So that the Old Testament became my illustration book. It became, it became the shadow book for all the realities of the New Covenant, and I was a minister of the New Covenant. Uh, so I, I would just say whatever widening, whatever elevation, whatever depth has come to my theology has, has been formed by, a, uh, by the precision of going through every text in the New Testament. My theology hasn't changed, but it is so much richer. I went back to, um, I'm, starting, I'm preaching through the Gospel of John for the first time in 40 some years. I did it first when I came to Grace in 1970, and I, I'm preaching through it again. I went back to some of my old notes. I interpreted everything the same way at a very shallow level. Uh, so that, that has been the difference. Uh, it's, it's more been the range and the depth and the, the richness of how I understand these things. And so they're far more uh, complete understandings than they were then. H.B., just in terms of your own theological development, what would you, what would you share out of that? Yeah, I, um, my father was uh, sound and conservative in his theology, so I, I didn't get exposed to a lot of exotic theology. Um, so I, that was a blessing to me. I would say... Um, God just brought, immediately as a 17-year-old, God just was bringing godly men into my life who were just investing in me and teaching me, pointing me to books. And in the process of that, I got pointed to uh, Dr. MacArthur's ministry. And for many, many years, I was preaching on Sunday mornings twice 
uh, and then driving out to the valley to sit uh, under Dr. MacArthur and then reading and learning um, from what I was being exposed to. Um, so I would say over the, over the years, I hope there's a, a growing understanding of scripture, maturity, a greater uh, depth, but God, I, I praise God, he kept me from exotic error, confusing stuff, and, and just his providence at a very fragile time, he kept me from, from those things, and I'm grateful for it. Yeah, I think in my own thought of my own life, the, the biggest change that has come has been uh, a greater reliance upon biblical theology. Uh, trained in my doctoral work in historical and systematic theology, I, my, my first theological instinct as a theologian was to organize, systematize, root in the theological and historical argument, but to have the scripture come alive in such a way that a biblical theology is formed out of a relentless pursuit of the text. And to be doing that now for so many decades, you really do realize a biblical theology is being formed here in which the instincts are now clearly, where does this go in the text? Where does this fall in the narrative? Where, 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 what is this pointing to? What pointed to this? How is this fulfilled? Uh, th that's the real excitement that, that uh, brings me to every text now. So you, you modeled that last night perfectly. You, you were dead on target on, on uh, soteriology, on the heart and soul of soteriology, the substitutionary atonement. And you, you, you obviously could have developed that systematically. You, you didn't. You, um, and that would be legitimate because there is a system to it and it can be categorized. But the, the explosion of that truth coming out of the text of Scripture carries the full power of the Spirit of God who inspired that text. And uh, I mean, that was a model of how to preach. Take one text and then expand it and, and move it so it was, it, it was exegetical theology, I would call it, and then it was biblical theology because you started in Genesis 22 and you ended up in the New Testament. Uh, and and that's, that's what, I think that's the best of expository preaching. Well, that is a very affirming word, and I just want to say that that's the kind of text that simply has my heart uh, which uh, I nearly lost at the end of the message simply because just to say those words in context, but where is the lamb? Um, and then to realize we're here in the name of the lamb. It's just unspeakable. There, there are certain majestic texts like that that just <clears throat> frame our, our understanding of the entire faith. Do you get caught up emotionally? Yes, I was afraid that was becoming a little too evident last night. Uh, and uh, because I, I, I was losing control of my voice at the end of the message, which is not something I anticipated, but it didn't surprise me either. But I think there are some of those monumental texts, not, not, that, not that these texts are more important, but that they are more clarifying, uh, perhaps in terms of biblical theology. They're, they're ones we go back to again and again what are some of those texts for, for you two men? You know, what, what, what are some of those texts you think of? You know, if, if I had one or two sermons to preach and I needed to say everything I felt I needed to say in ministry, if I, if I just had that stewardship, I mean, John, you've been in Russia, you've been in all over the world where you've got, okay, now you've got, you've got to give them everything you can give them. Where do you go? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm always looking uh, to establish the authority of, of Scripture and, and the supremacy of Christ. Um, that, that has ebbed and flowed through the years. Uh, Psalm 19 ha, uh, has been a very important text to me because it's God's own summarizing definition of how He views His Word, um, particularly verses 7 to the end of the chapter. That, that is a definitive text. Looking back at our church, Psalm 19, which I strung out for a period of time at our church, had a a pronounced impact on us in the early years. In, in later years, um, a five-part series on the, the forgiving father, which traditionally is called the prodigal, uh, was a stunning five weeks in our church. Uh, I was reminded that it ended 
the last two were on a Christmas Sunday and then a New Year Sunday. People wept uh, because of that. I, I think in, in recent years, Isaiah 53, I did 10 messages on Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. It took me 10 messages to move that and I moved through that. And our congregation is so fully informed on the realities of the New Testament picture of Christ. I, I told them, I said, this is like where's Waldo? If you don't know what Waldo looks like, you can't find him. So you're not going to find Christ in the Old Testament by looking first there. You're going to have to know him so well from the new that you can find him in the, in the old. Wow. And so um, it was after all these years of going through the Gospels, years and years in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they knew Christ. And then I did this little series on finding Christ in the Old Testament. And it was just explosive in the church, and it culminated in Isaiah 53. And I would think if our people go back and look at touchstones, it would be Luke 15, Isaiah 53 would kind of be at the top of the list. Every once in a while you hear things, you think these two things don't naturally go together, like John MacArthur and Where's Waldo? <laughs> and, uh, but the, the point... No, I have grandchildren. <laughs> yes, right. Made, made the point emphatically. <laughs> H.B., what are some of those passages that you think you and your people just kind of rest in as definitive for who you are and what you believe? Yeah, I, um, so it took me months to, to move to Jacksonville, and I was preaching on the weekends in Los Angeles, and they asked me to fly during those months to Jacksonville, um, to preach on Wednesday nights. And before I moved to Jacksonville, I started a series, I just wanted to lay down a gauntlet. I preached through Psalm 119, uh, stanza by stanza, because I wanted that to be the first statement about what my ministry there would be about. Um, and the first uh, series I did when I arrived on Sundays was Luke 15. Um, not, not knowing the environment, the setting, and the uh, God gave me a way to present the gospel um, and to present the gospel in the parables uh, and stories that people assume they know and try to, to make them live again. And those were that that was a that was a big starting moments for us there. I think this can come in times and seasons too, because uh, I find myself rather continually drawn to give attention to Romans chapter 1. Because of the urgencies of this hour, we all of a sudden realize I, I need to explain what the Bible says right now about what's going on and situated in biblical theology. And Romans 1 is one of those texts. And I, I think there's so many others. I think right now, uh, I think an awful lot of evangelical preachers need to go back to Genesis 1.1. Because I think what we've lost in terms of the doctrine of creation is bringing a horrifying harvest of bad doctrine, bad theology, lack of biblical confidence, and, and, and just messing up the whole flow of Scripture, you know, from that point onward. So I think at times there are different texts that... I think a, a wrong view of Genesis 1 and 2 is a virus that, it, that infects the rest of the text. If you learn bad habits there, those bad habits will continue in every subsequent chapter of Scripture. So let me turn the tables and then ask another question. What's the hardest text that you can think of that, that comes to your mind and say, I think that was a genuinely difficult text to preach? I, uh, I'd like to have a swing at that one again. Do any texts like that come to mind? Well, for me, um, I, I don't know that I want to do it again. <laughs> so I could buy into your question halfway through. Uh, well, two books stand out as being, uh, in, well, three as being intensely difficult for me. Um, I went through verse by verse the book of Zechariah. <laughs> um, I didn't know what I was getting into, but as a sequential expositor, I was in. Um, <laughs> I went through the book of Daniel, uh, really daunting, daunting experiences. Um, another text was the Table of Nations in Genesis. 
that was extremely challenging to me, to chase down all those identifiable tribes and groups and make sense out of all that and why it's there. Um, I, I would say those were very difficult. This might surprise you. I found it early in my ministry difficult to go through First John because I, I kept having to explain that it's not quite this black and white. You know what I'm saying? Um, everything is, he doesn't, he does, he doesn't, he does. You won't, you will. And I, I mean, I'm a little like, I'm Johanny. It's my name and I kind of lean to being a little bit black and white. So I was always bouncing over to Paul for the exception. I, I found that very challenging and I, I had a very serious low point uh, going through the going through First John uh, when I was much younger, because I felt like I I wasn't being faithful to the text, and um, it, it was it was probably the the lowest point in my ministry. Just the agony in my own heart, uh, feeling like I had to fix this all the time. I needed to mature in my understanding. That's really interesting. You know, I think the table of the nations in the flow of biblical theology. It's one of the most important texts. I appreciate you mentioning that because you get from the table of the nations eventually to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what gets you from one to the other is the gospel. It's an incredible flow of biblical history. But I understand the, the, by the time you end up with all those names and all those tribes and, and kindred and families and clans, that's, that's a task. HB? Yeah, just um, the first book I preached through in Jacksonville on Sundays was Philippians. And I, I've been meditating on it a lot, thinking about it again, only because the mood of the church in six years was so different. It was hurt, divided, troubled. And I just, there, I, I think about how the church would hear Philippians now. The great challenge for me, last summer, I was going to do a brief series on the first six chapters of Daniel, you know, uh, in between series, and uh, had a friend. So, oh, no, HB, go all the way. The, the fun is not until you get past chapter six. <laughs> <clears throat> and I listened and almost quit the ministry struggling through, <laughs> through Daniel. I just was like, one of, those, one of those latter prophetic chapters, to be honest with you, I, I read it, and I called this sermon, God Wins. And I just reconstructed it as best I could, and I said, what do we do with this? And I said, at the end, God wins. <laughs> you know what you did? You cleaned it up. <laughs> Uh, I, I will tell you, and I've never said this in public before, the hardest book in the Bible for me to preach is the Psalms, hmm. verse by verse, psalm by psalm. And I'm going to be very explicit and say, I think why. It's because it wears down my heart in all the wailing of sorrow and the, the burden of being persecuted and the... the hostility of the enemies and uh, it, it really leads me to wonder and, and this is why I'm thinking about it very much right now given the shift in our culture given the shift in, in our time given the fact that we're going to be experiencing and even are now experiencing some hints of this kind of hostility I'm wondering if, if, if preaching the Psalms is going to get easier now but you know I realized that I started preaching the Psalms when I was so young and so healthy and uh when it didn't appear that we were living in a season of that kind of, of hostility, well, I, I couldn't identify directly and personally with a lot of what was being said here. And it seemed like David was going up to the heights and then so quickly you'd find yourself down in the valley. And I, I, I didn't feel that fall. I, I wonder honestly if preaching the Psalms is gonna get easier for us because we're gonna identify with a lot more of it in sh fairly short order. You know, along that line, um... Second Corinthians, 
when I went through Second Corinthians, and you know, I hadn't made a conscious decision to postpone it till deep into my ministry, I was so glad that I had been battered and beaten up by my own congregation, leaders in the church. There had been a mutiny of 250 people who marched out of Grace Church. I had a meeting with my elders, 35 elders sitting in a room, divided over whether I should even be the pastor, whether to dismiss me, whether I was too involved, not involved enough. I had been through um, personal assaults and attacks from inside the church. I, I, I just was so thankful by the, that I had postponed 2 Corinthians or the, the, the Lord had never let me get to it until I could get some sense of what Paul was going through. And I think there is that reality in your ministry. You know, when people say, well, you're going through the New Testament, how do you choose your way through? And you would know this too, HB. You're listening to your congregation. You're looking and seeing what they need. You're not really dealing with your own heart and what you're necessarily interested in. I mean, to a point you do, but and so the Lord kind of moves you through. In retrospect, you don't have any feeling about that because you don't know when the Lord's leading that way. But in looking back in retrospect, that was one really divine reality that I can see in my ministry. That I would never have grasped that book uh, un until deeper into my ministry. But having preached through the entire New Testament, book by book, uh, you've made some decisions on the other side of that. Frankly, I've never known anyone who had the opportunity to make decisions on the other side of that, other than yourself. And you decided to go back to certain portions of the Scripture. Does that imply that you believe there are certain books that commend themselves to be preached to a congregation in such a way that whatever you do, you need to make sure you preach these books? Well, I mean, the first reality is I'm done. I'm supposed to be dead. <clears throat> but I'm not. So uh, I'm, I'm preaching from the hearse. It just hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> so yes, the answer to the question. Uh, I did the Gospel of John in 1970. I didn't give a fair treatment to the Gospel of John. If I'm going to leave a legacy, and everybody does, I need to do it with, with a depth that's reflective of where I am now, and particularly the Gospel of John, particularly that. And that, that, that was not only my decision, that the leaders of the church would just said, would you please do the Gospel of John? They're probably reflecting the fact that they had listened to those early messages because that was all that was there. Um, but the other thing was people in the church came to me and said, we would love it if you would take us through the book of Acts. I had done that, I don't know, 30-some years ago. Uh, and so at the, at the request of the congregation, Sunday nights we're going through the book of Acts, and Sunday morning uh, going through the Gospel of John. Uh, and I, I stop at points and inject, and I also... On Sunday nights, um, I've got so many gifted young preachers, giving them an opportunity to, to fill those slots. So cause I'm not, not going to live long enough at the rate I go to get through the book of Acts anyway. Um, but there, I think the people are more interested in the early chapters than they are all, all of the history of the Apostle Paul, how the church is structured, how it's set up, why it is the way it is. H.B.? Yeah, I would just affirm the Gospels and Acts. And um, Romans, I think I was influenced early by Dr. MacArthur's work on Ephesians. Um, I was trying to get through it when I left. I thought it was important. I haven't gotten to it now. But I think we're living in a time where the, the, the nature of the church um, is important. And the building up of the body of Jesus Christ and what it means to walk as the church of Jesus Christ is important for us to hear these things. I think it's very helpful. I would simply offer this. In, in terms of, I think there, there are at least two great responsibilities the preacher has for a congregation. One is to make sure they're grounded in the story of Jesus. And that's where the gospels are so important. Uh, to be grounded in who Jesus is, why he came, what he did, why we're saved. But I wanna go back to biblical theology for a moment and say that the preacher who walks his congregation verse by verse through two books, I'll just offer this as, because biblical theology is everywhere, but if you, in the New Testament, if you go verse by verse through these two books, your congregation is going to know more biblical theology than the graduates of most seminaries in this country. And that is, if you'll take them verse by verse through Romans and verse by verse through Hebrews, 
They'll know biblical theology. They'll know how to read the Old Testament. And, uh, and, and the gospels that they know will now come alive in a whole new way because they're going to see them in a bigger picture. Yeah. Hebrews was the first commentary I wrote. It was very early in our ministry for that very reason. And over the years, I preached through Romans three times. Yeah. And I'm trying to resist the temptation to go again. Uh, so formative. I think the times may pull you back into Romans. <laughs> Because well, we are like living, you, we're living How many there, times okay. a year do you preach on Romans 1? A lot. Me too. I just did the ACBC. That's yes. ACBC, not ACDC conference. <laughs> I keep making that distinction. Once again, he knows to make that distinction. <laughs> um, that was the National Biblical Counseling, right. and they asked if I would speak on, a, on understanding the world, and you, you just find yourself sucked into That's Romans right. chapter 1 all the time. So definitive. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think those kinds of passages should be unapologetically uh, where we go, because we're not just going there. We're training our congregations to go there. I, I want people in the pew to realize when they're looking at the news where they need to go. Romans 1, that's where I situate this. That's where I know this. I'm watching the suppression of truth and unrighteousness right now. I'm watching the exchange of the truth of God for a lie right now. That's what's happening. And that's why Paul's not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the only rescue from that. Yes. Yeah, and then you, then you're, watching, you're watching the evidence of the wrath of God that's fallen. Sexual revolution followed by a homosexual revolution followed by a reprobate mind. So, HB, Lord willing, you've got decades ahead of you in ministry. Dr. John MacArthur is going <laughs> to speak. I want to invite you right now to speak at my retirement. <laughs> Uh, because I, 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 as I said, when you mean I like was like he being dead yet speaks. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean, woe unto the man who tries to stop you. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, b back when the Shepherds Conference last year, when I uh, introduced my message, you know, you had just preached from. We had a power outage, and you preached from <laughs> a an iPhone light over your message. You can't be stopped. <laughs> You know, I you have can that, turn off the light. You took a photo of me. I did. You went to some drugstore and you had it made into and framed it I did. and delivered it. It hangs in uh, in my study as a constant oh. reminder that I need to keep going even if the power goes out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, to me, it was just the quintessential moment. I'm sitting on the front row and he's preaching. The lights go out. You know, most preachers would say, okay, we're done. Next thing I know, he's holding an iPhone over the biblical text and preaching to thousands of people without any amplification. And I just thought, you know, the, energi the Energizer Bunny just retired. <laughs> and that just doesn't work. But for whatever time any of us have left, what do we want to do in preaching? Uh, <clears throat> for me, uh, I've sort of redefined myself uh, to pour my energies on the last lap uh, in, into the Master Seminary so that I can invest in the next generation. Uh, I, I want to I don't wanna make sure that I'm, um, I, I want to make sure that when I'm gone, it's like taking your hand out of a bucket of water, there's no hole. Uh, so I just want to amp uh, up all the investment I can make in young preachers, not, not just by a sort of influence from my preaching, but by hands-on investment in their lives. And I can do that because I have hundreds of them right there, and um, I, I, I want to see them cover the globe, you know, not only in America but around the world, and, and reproduce this. So I just want to do everything I can on a personal level to interact with them and invest in them. Um, there's never an exhausting of, of material in the Word of God at all. Um, I will keep going through these books I'm going through at the church as long as I need to, and if I have to go back to Ephesians, I'll do that. But on a wider scale, I'll be drawing from all the years of resources like I'm doing now. I have a couple of projects. I just finished a book on parables. It's done, and uh, part of it's being reflected in this. I want to finish one more book in a trilogy, The Gospel According to Jesus, The Gospel According to the Apostles, and all the material is collected on The Gospel According to Paul. So that would be a three-book uh, treatment of the gospel. That, that's, that's a project that's underway. I finished the commentary series, so really, I, I don't have any clear objective beyond those things. There's an entire Old Testament out there. 
<laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I'm in this small window where I'm old enough to know what I need to and I don't have Alzheimer's yet and I'm just trying to make the most out of that one. HB, what's your passion as you are running the race? Sure. I'm uh, 41 years old and uh, turning 40 was traumatic for me. I was just like, oh my Oh, go goodness. cry somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, it was just you're, breaking, very... you're breaking my heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it got me re really reflecting. And one of the things just out of a lot of meditation, I just, I, I am passionate about preaching the word of God. And Dr. MacArthur has been a model for me, and I'm praying that with the years he gives me that I, I'm able to work through the books of the New Testament. But um, during this time, I also just feel like um, I'm a pastor. And even the sermon I preached this morning is in the context of the congregational life of our church. Um, it was just in the providence of God that I was preaching this section of Ephesians 2 through, middle of Ephesians 2 through Ephesians 3, in the pastoral life of where we were as a church. And I'm, I'm just praying that God will not only let me faithfully preach, but God will use that preaching to, to nurture a church that will be healthy and growing to his glory. You know, along that line, you preached what you're preaching to your people. I, I'm preaching this week what I've just preached to our people, and that's kind of been a pattern. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, that's a true accountability that what happens at home is what you do on the road. What happens on the road is what you do at home. Well, I'll just conclude this by a personal note and say that I've never been more of a premillennialist than now. And I sense in my preaching more of a sense of judgment coming as the background, everything I do, as I'm preparing a message, I, I think more than I did at an earlier stage in my life of the fact that this is in the backdrop to a massive day of visitation that's coming. And uh, we know not the time nor the hour, but the seasons tell us that the urgency is now to preach with the wrath of God and judgment coming as the background. and. I will tell you that changes the way you think of the text. That changes the way you think of the stewardship of the opportunity to preach. And so I'm far more eschatological in my preaching than I was just 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, I sense that that's going to be a coming and not a going thing, uh, simply because I think the text does it, I think biblical theology does it, and I think the times are underlining that reality in a way that those who are biblically minded are going to be very judgment minded and very eschatologically minded, uh, or we're going to miss the point. Yes. Well, brothers, thank you. HB and Dr. McArthur, we thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for sharing your hearts. Thanks for honesty.